Well, first of all, thank you all for being here today. Um, it's very nice outside, so I'm not sure if that says something about you, me, or how important the topic is, but I'm really delighted that you chose to come and spend this evening with us. So I made the decision today to start in a place that, as researchers, we don't normally start. Um, I want to start today with some thanks. I want to give some context to the work that we're doing in honor of the focus of the lecture series this year, which is about bridging research and community, I wanted to take a moment to honor the community that I come from. I grew up in Tulalip, Washington. I was born and raised on the reservation. And many of the people who are in this room today are people who have played an important role in my development as a person and as a scholar. When I think about what it means to look towards developing and seeing the strengths of indigenous children, I recognize that it's the direction for the future in part because there were people who saw that in me. It helped me to realize that that narrow band, the narrow narrative in which native children are seen, right, this as struggling, as, as having a variety of deficits, Right, so we can think about things like graduation rates being poor, among the, the lowest graduation rates in the country. We think about things like um, native, even when they do graduate, that they're not adequately prepared for college. Well, that narrative of the struggling student has taken on a life of its own. And what happens in the end is that native students start to wonder whether they're struggling, even in the absence of struggle. We get so caught up in this narrative that it's important for us to reframe and redirect the story. And we want to do that to free children up to reach their potential. And so today, as I think about what this image, I just want to go back for a second, when I think about what it means to me, right, if you look up at the top where you see the houses, that is the beach that I grew up on. The people here, the, the canoe out there is our family canoe. Many of the people in that canoe happen to be my relatives. And it just so happens that my uncle is sitting on the ro rock here, um, and he is now one of the oldest tribal council leaders in our community. He's 88 and on the tribal council. But what I love about this is that it represents the beauty of what I knew, and I didn't know myself through struggle. Right? We didn't have money when I was a kid. We didn't have a lot of things, but that's not how I thought about myself. You know what you live. And there were strengths in that. And it wasn't until I went to school that I started to realize that people saw me in a different way, that people wondered if I would struggle. And this is so important in part because these little children, right, they are our future. And we think about all the time what it means to redirect, reframe, and retrain, not the children, but the adults they interface with. And so the last thing I want to do is just point out that in the canoe, you see people holding up the paddle. And so these paddles, when you hold it up like that, it's a way of honoring it, whether it be the other canoe that's coming towards you, or if you've come to the land, the people who greet you on the land. And so today, I hold it up to you because you chose to come to hear about this important topic. And so going forward, as we start to set up this idea of the Native student as a struggler and what it means to reframe this idea, I want to begin by thinking about how do we do this. Well, I offer today a look at, a look at this through a bigger picture, which we in my field refer to as the culture cycle. The culture cycle reminds us that to truly alleviate the achievement gap, we have to start by looking at every piece of the culture cycle. So when we think about a child in a classroom, it isn't just about the child and the teacher. It's about so much more. It's about the ideas that stand behind why children go to school. It's the ideas that lead to the, to the development of the school or that set the stage for what we see as the good or the right way to be a student. 
Within that, we set up institutions, right? So we have schools, we have the media, but we also have classrooms, and we have microcultures within classrooms in which teachers play a role. So we get to this level of the interaction, and within the interaction, that's between the student and the teacher. But sometimes, what our field has shown, it's not just between us in relationship, it's between us in representational space. It is the idea the teacher has about me as a student that allows that space between us to shape the interaction and ultimately for young children to shape their development and the outcomes that we see. And so often in psychology, when we do research, much of what we do is we focus in this space. But as a cultural and social psychologist, one of the things that we've tried to do is to bring back in sociocultural contexts. And so today, when we think about social context, what it tells us is that at every level of the cultural cycle, there are representations, there are ideas and images about the right or good way to be a person. And for a long time, as Right, an example of this, for a long time, how we thought about what was possible for boys and girls, it helped us to understand that what we thought was shaping what was possible for girls. And so, as an example, this is a book that came out in the 1970s. It was a very popular book. I am not going to read you the book, but I'm going to share a few pages of the book with you. Boys Fix Things. Girls need things fixed. <laughs> boys invent things. Girls use what boys invent, right? And so today, we rail against these ideas. I mean, the government and not National Science Foundation, the president, teachers, STEM in every school, right? Science, technology, engineering, math. We understand today that it's these ideas that led to girls not becoming inventors and not fixing things. And we now know that to rail against those ideas requires a complete reshaping of the culture. And so we have come far, but not that far. In many of these fields, girls are still greatly underrepresented. And so building on that idea, here is a quote from Krober and Kleckholm, right? If a teacher who has had great success in teaching white students does not get comparably good results with Native children, she thinks this is because Native children are less bright. As a matter of fact, the trouble is often that the incentives, which have worked beautifully to make white children bestir themselves, leave native children cold or even actively trouble and confuse them. For instance, the teacher holds out the hope of a college education, with all that this implies for getting on in the white world. To at least the younger native child, this means mainly a threat of being taken even further from home and country. This was written more than 60 years ago, and it still would apply today. We have not come that far in our understanding of the variables impacting school for tribal children. And yet, we have many examples of students who do well, which means that it's possible. And so in the work that I want to talk about today, I want to focus on what are features of the culture cycle, right? So I'm a social psychologist. We study social context, that, that interface between person and situation. And so I'm not interested in just looking inside the person. I want to see the person in the situation. And the question for me is always, what do we do to change the situation to reframe the outcome for the individual. And so today, I'm going to give you three, I'm going to focus on three parts of my work. First, I'm going to talk about cultural models, which are a feature of the culture cycle. And within that, I'm going to show one quick study on academic performance and one on reframing cultural models. Next, I'm going to talk about growth mindsets. So growth mindsets are theories about potential. And when we look at how children learn what their theory about potential is, we come to understand the ways in which the messages we give as the adults in children's lives 
or better yet, the rules we set up in school or what we reward in school or what we reward in society, we teach children what they're not more than what they are. And finally, I want to talk about some work we did in Marysville between 2011 and 2014. And in doing so, I want to acknowledge that a couple of my partners in this work are here today, um, Kristen DeWitt and Dr. Kinoshida. And so it's important for me to recognize them because when we talk about doing work in communities, nothing happens without a team. Nothing, nobody is a sole arbitrator in all of this. It takes a team, it takes a village. Okay, so I wanna start by talking about cultural models and what that looks like. So in mainstream society, there's now nearly three decades of research that tells us that mainstream middle-class contexts are driven by a set of cultural norms, values, and belief that center the individual as independent and separate from others. Now, for many people who grow up in these middle-class European-American contexts, what that looks like are these small practices. So if you have a child early on, you start by giving children choices. You encourage your child to have and engage in self-expression. You teach them that what they think, what they want, what they like is important. Nothing wrong with that, but it is a particular cultural model. And it turns out that it's a unique model, that most of the world does not engage in that model. And yet most of psychology comes out of that model. And so when we think about choice and self-expression, right, we get to a sense that what is good, right? So our understanding of the self as separate from others becomes the good or right way to be a self. So establishing independence as you grow up becomes the goal of becoming a good, healthy adult. But in many parts of the world, that type of separation from others is not only unheard of, but it would be seen as unhealthy. And so you start to see the ways in which these models, what is good, what is healthy, is absolutely tied to the context in which we develop. And so good actions promote separation from other, others and individual self-expression. Now, a more common model is the interdependent model of self. Now, when I say common, it's actually the case that most people in the world, outside of the United States, engage in this more interdependent model. So too do low-income European Americans. So too do most underrepresented minority groups in the US, Asians, African Americans, Latinos, Native Americans. And what's nice about this model is that it's actually one way we can think about people that doesn't allow us or require us to say, oh, Native people are like this, African American people are like this, white people are like this. What the model does is it helps us to understand that we all relate to the world in different ways. I'm guessing that if I took a poll, there are women in this room who are European American who feel like they might be that interdependent self. You might be. And, and a model, understanding these models allows for variation. So this interdependent model is an understanding of self as interdependent with others in social context. So good actions, right? So what your context said is a good or right or healthy way to be, promote connection to others and attention to others' preferences. So yesterday I was in a meeting, and in that meeting we determined that there were a number of things that had happened over time that didn't turn out so well in the larger structure of the community, but when you step back you realize they were done in the interest of maintaining harmony within the community. So what ends up being good, right, how you make those decisions are not always about just thinking about one specific thing, is you have to always think about how that extends out to other people. So in a small community, if you have a fight with someone, right, it doesn't just impact your relationship with that person, but in an interdependent context, it might also impact your relationship with their family. Right? And it might last for generations. 
And it's truly what it means to be interdependent is to understand the ways in which one must step back from that and sometimes sacrifice saying what you want to say or doing what you want to do because it's not in the best interest of the larger whole. And so these models of self have been shown to be very predictive. They have been shown to influence the ways that we think in very small ways. And I just want to give you a couple little examples. We had done some associations. This is work I did way back in graduate school. So we had looked at what associations come to mind when European American and Native American college students think about education. Now, what's interesting is that, of course, right, these are college students, so everybody has some commonality. We all think about things like the acquisition of knowledge, attributes of the school setting, right, tools for success. Now, it is the case that the European American students thought about this more than the Native students, but nonetheless, right, they're all in this context, and those are important features of that context. But then there are these things that Native students thought about that European American students did. So for them, when they thought about education, one in five of them thought about education as a tool to help their community. And then there were another one in five who, when they thought about education, didn't think about the school at all. They thought about their family members. They thought about the people in their community who were their real teachers. And so it's also the case that Right, as one might expect, given the history of education in this country, that a large percentage of the students also had negative associations with education despite being in college. Right? So if we were to actually do these associations with students that didn't make it to college, it's quite likely these associations would look different. Now, if we do the same associative, right? so our models in our head are all about these associations. Right? And so if we're thinking about relationships, then we expect something different from that person. So in the case of teachers, once again, there's a lot of overlap in what people thought about. But what was different is that, again, Native Americans thought about close others who were not teachers. And right, then you also saw some of these other associations that they were more likely to think of negative attributes. Well, why this is important? is that when we start to think at in, about individual Native students and that some proportion of them have this association in their mind between school, teacher, relationship, it means that they expect to have a relationship with the person who is their teacher. But in most mainstream classrooms, Teachers don't necessarily think, oh, I better develop a relationship with this kid so that they will learn. Right? More and more we center ideas of relationship, but we tend to do it in different kinds of ways. There's an expectation that when you come to the classroom, you are supposed to be a learner. But that's an expectation that separates the learner from the other, right? It's that independent framework. Right? This is me, this is you, you make the choice to be a learner. And if you don't, that's your choice. But for a lot of children who grow up in these interdependent contexts, that's not the choice that they see. They see that learning is something that happens in relationship because important people are your teacher. And so that expectation of relationship is driving their experience. So we actually assessed this with Native high school students. So we did a study of Native and European American high school students, a test of these cultural models. And we included, because of the association task, we included in this measures of trust. Because we know that trust is an important variable when we think about what predicts outcomes, or at least the associations would suggest that would be true. Now, if it's the case, right, so we can look, and this is just some straightforward um, means of independence and interdependence. Now, one thing that is really interesting is if you look here, you see the higher interdependence levels for Native women, but not for Native men. And what's interesting about it is in this sample, it's also the case that the women are doing better in education than men. 
And so one way that one might explain that is that it's easier for Native women to find relationship in part because other women are relationship driven. But it's very hard for Native men in a hyper independence context being a male to find the relationship that they need. And in fact, Right? As we go forward, we see, as we would expect, that the native high school students are less trusting across all domains. But when we put trust for teacher into the bigger picture, the model works perfectly. So what we find is for the European American high school students, the best predictor of grades is how independent they felt. Right? How separate, autonomous from others they felt predicted how well they did in school. For Native students who are in the same school, right, which is so important when we consider the, the context variable, it's completely the opposite. So when you look over here on the right, what you see is that trust for teacher and interdependence are the best protectors for education. So there's a cultural mismatch because their teachers are not Native in this context. And so that expectation, when we start to think about right, what makes me feel like a good person, what makes me feel legitimate, that this context is for me, that I belong in this context, is that match between what I expect from the context, what I expect from the people there, and how I understand myself. And so often what happens, and this is becoming a bigger issue as we continue to diversify as a country, is that more and more st students need their other ways of being to be legitimated in that context. So they feel that match. And here's what's really fascinating about it, is that it's subtle. It's, it's implicit. It's something that kids don't know they need it. it. It happens under the radar, even for them. What they feel is some subtle feeling that I don't belong here, or this is not for me. And so, in essence, the difference in culture is pushing them out the door in these subtle ways. But then, through the American frame, they think they're choosing to leave. And so, going forward, we started to think, can we reframe these contexts? Can we understand what it would mean for a teacher to be able to put out a different framing, something so simple as how you encourage a child to get an education? And I'll be honest, I actually got this idea from a teacher. So I've spent a lot of time in the Marysville School District, a lot of time doing research, hanging out, talking to teachers. But we had a teacher who came up to me who absolutely adored the Native students in her class. And she said to me, oh, I love, I mean, so she had these two boys that she really just, I mean, they had her heart. And she said, I keep telling them that if you get an education, you can change your life. And as she said it, I thought, hmm, that's very independence-based, right? I immediately wondered if she said to them, if you get an education, you can change your tribal community. Would that have a different outcome? And we tested it. And we tested whether it mattered if that came from an in-group member or an out-group member. So we offered Native kids role models who were either white or Native, and we always offered them same gender role models. And so they either were then told, getting an education will benefit you in the future, or, Getting an education will benefit your tribe in the future. And what we found is that in the control condition, kids reported being about 75% motivated in school, right, across variables. But when we give them the independence, right, getting an education is good for you, it, across all of the studies we've done, we see the same pattern where the rates go down. It's not significant. Maybe if we did a meta-analysis across all studies, we'd see significance here. But in essence, giving them education the way it's typically framed does not motivate them. But then, if we try giving them the way it's typically framed, but with a native role model, eh, you see some benefit. But if you give them with a native role model in education, and you say to them, getting an education will benefit your tribe, compared to the control condition, you get almost a 20% boost in motivation.
And so these models have a way, if we understand them as educators, we can reframe that context for them. And so across all of the work that we've done in this area, so I'm just going to offer you a summary, what we have learned is that for European American students, right, their strength, what, what drives them, what motivates them, right, and not every single one of them, but the majority of them, is that education is a tool to get ahead in life. It fits the model, it's what we expect. Learning is about developing autonomous, independent thinkers, Individual competition and achievement are valued above cooperation, and teachers help students achieve personal needs and goals. For Native students, we've learned that in order to reveal and to build on and capitalize on their strengths, right, we need to know that for many, education is a tool to help their family and community. And so literally, they're motivated to go there and be there because they can help their community. Learning occurs in interaction with others, Social support, role models, mentorship, community connections, and trusting relationships with teachers are essential features of persistence and motivation. So as we think about these cultural models, I now am going to switch to talking about mindsets. They're not unrelated, but I want to be able to bring them together at the end. So in the next part, we focused a lot in our thinking about culture, working with schools, and I'm going to show you a number of longitudinal studies that we've done. But we wanted to look at theories about potential. So, so much of education is about what we think is possible. I heard Ari Treisman um, give a talk at the White House, and he talked about how one of the downsides to American education is that we go through school and we learn what we're not instead of what we are. So we learn, I'm not good at math. We learn, I'm not good at sports. We learn, I'm not good at relationships. We, right? And so we, it, it's a lot harder. It's sort of like a weeding out process. You're five, and we tell you you can do anything. When you're 12, we tell you maybe not everything. And by the time you graduate, we've told you exactly what you are good at and what you are not. But there's some sadness to that, right? Because it, it, what it suggests is some fixed ideas that some people are good at science. I've actually heard educators say, my family, we just don't have the science brain. We just don't have the math brain. Kids in my family, we just don't do math. Right? But math is just a set of skills. And when you have a good teacher who builds those skills, you can do math. Research shows it. We've proven it. Beyond a doubt, Americans do not use, people around the world do not use the full capacity of their brain. What we have the ability to learn, now that we have fMRI studies, we are nowhere near meeting the potential of our brain. And so these mindsets give us another way for thinking about how we can build on indigenous children's strengths. So we started by measuring them, trying to develop a theory about how it works. So for the mindset research, right, past research, decades of research have shown the link between mindsets and motivation between mindsets and performance. So a fixed mindset is the belief that intelligence, athletic ability, and personality are fixed traits. Growth mindset, intelligence, athletic ability, and personality are changeable qualities, a potential that can be developed. Talent is a starting point. In the years I spent in the school, what is so amazing about these, this work that won't come out in the data are the great stories of little kids who learn to have a growth mindset and who tell us these amazing stories about how they were misbehaving in class because they thought the teacher thought that they weren't smart. And so we taught them that actually not only are they smart, but everyone has the ability to learn and that what the teacher wants is for them to work hard. And that child was freed that day. I mean, that child walked into the classroom and declared to his teacher, wait a minute, you just want me to work hard? And the teacher, having no idea about what went on in our study, simply said, well, of course. And he said, but you don't, you don't think I'm dumb? And the teacher told us later that she almost cried. And she said, of course I don't. And he said, oh, OK. And it changed his behavior. Right, so the message this kid had gotten, the teacher had never told him she thought he was dumb. But the message for many children are those subtle messages, those little things that push you out, that make you question your belonging. 
And so we measure growth mindset. And I'm going to show you the kid's version so that you can see. In the, in the older kid versions, all we do is we don't use the dolls. But with kids, it's cute. So I'm going to show you anyway. We use dolls because kids who are 5 to 8 don't have the ability to do abstract thinking. And so we role play with them. We call them little people. We don't call them do dolls because boys won't play. And so we, we engage them by having a teacher doll who interacts with them. And there are two features of this that we learn in this interaction. So one is we measure academic self-view. And I'll show you in a second how we do that. And second, we measure growth mindset. And so here's an example of what it looks like. Right? When we set up these situations, we want kids to feel not threatened. Right? And so we put out little toys for them to play with. We allow them some time to build a little world around them. And then we start these interactions where what we're going to do is set up scenarios and then ask them how they would respond to those scenarios. OK, so in, for academic, for academic self-view, what we looked at were attributes like smart, um, nice to teachers. So over time, we, real, we learned from kids that these are what they associate with being good students. Which makes sense, because 5 to 8 is more about social emotional development. And so things like helping the teacher, being nice, does what the teacher asks, get, gets most out of the schoolwork, goes, sorry, gets most of the schoolwork right, nice to other students, and helps teachers and other students clean up classroom. Right? What's interesting is that when we started the work, one of my collaborators said, you're never going to get kids to say, no, this is not me. But my colleague was wrong. On average, native students said no to 2.7 of these variables. So already at age 5 to 8, they had learned that some of these attributes for them were not them. Now, there's a heartbreaking part to that, but I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to uplift you in just a second. Give me a moment. Right? So we ask them these attributes about what is a good student, and then we ask them, which of these attributes are you? And it turns out that what they think is a good student is not what predicts. What they associate with them is. Now, for mindsets, what we do is we set up little feedback, ex ex feedback scenarios. So imagine that you are playing with the blocks. There are blocks all over the floor. Teacher Debbie asks you to put them neatly on the shelf. A little while later, Teacher Debbie comes back and says, there are still blocks on the floor, and the ones on the shelf are messy. That's not cleaning up the right way, right? So it's a negative feedback scenario. And just so you know, we always end with a positive feedback scenario because we always want kids to walk away feeling happy. So then we ask them, next time, would you want to clean up the blocks, or would you let someone else do it? Well, what we find is that kids vary in their response. If they're fixed mindset and they get negative feedback, they want someone else to clean it up next time. If they're growth mindset, then their response to this negative feedback is that they're going to do it because they're going to get it right the next time. And so we have a variety of scenarios that we use. Now, before I get into the model of th how we've thought about this work, I want you to know that ov overall, right, as I mentioned, we know that mindsets have all kinds of positive value. But for Native students, our prior research has shown that there are ethnic differences on growth mindset responses, with Native students endorsing growth mindset less than European American students. Again, right, that's sad because what it suggests is that the messages Native students are receiving are already telling them something about their potential. But right, we know why. I mean, our, my field has been studying this for a long time. Stereotypes, they're more likely to see positive, or less likely to see positive examples of their group right, represented as good students, or to be exposed to curriculum that is decidedly Native American. And so what this tells us, though, is that it's in the message. The upside is we can change the message. And so what I want to do is show you the ways in which we looked at a variety of factors in the schools. And we have now, we have four samples. I'm going to talk about three today because they build nicely on each other. But three samples where we're looking at predictors of school grades. So we know growth mindset to school grades. But what we don't know is what mediates that relationship. And so in my thinking, right, and the experience of that young 
boy who, who, right, was misbehaving because he thought his teacher thought he was not smart. We put in there teacher's assessment of classroom behavior. And so if they don't have a high score on this, it means that they're disruptive in the classroom. If they have a high score, it means that we've created a model that helps us to understand what we need to change to help students behave better, to feel motivated to behave better, right? It's the right context, the right situation for the right behavior. So in the first study we did, we look only at this first three variables. So we don't have school grades in the model yet. We're merely looking at the relationship between growth mindset, academic self-view, and positive classroom behaviors. So as expected, right, we found a relationship between growth mindset and positive classroom behavior. So the more potential you perceive yourself as having, the better behaved you are in the classroom. Now, it turns out, however, that that relationship goes away when we put in one other variable. So we have in my field what's referred to as a full mediation model. So when we put academic self-view in this model, what we find is that the relationship between growth mindset and academic self-view is very strong. And so the more growth mindset you are, the more positively you identify with these attributes of being a good student, and that predicts positive classroom behavior. And when you put that in the model, this stops being significant, right? So if we had stopped here, we'd have made an incorrect causal connection. We would have assumed this link. Because what's really going on is that through their ideas about their mindset, it's shaping their ideas about themselves in school. And that is leading to their better behavior. So we try this with another classroom of third to fifth graders, and we find the full model, right? So we find that growth mindset, right, predicts academic self-view. And again, while these are related, the important, like the more powerful line of this is that growth mindset predicts academic self-view, which predicts positive classroom behavior. And not only does that then predict school grades, but it accounts for 54% of the variance in performance. That is huge in a model. I mean, often in our models, if we get 10%, if we can account for 10% of the variance in student performance, we're jumping up and down. We're predicting 54% of the variance in student outcomes. But what's exciting to me about this Right, is that it gives us inroads. It tells us places that we can start, where we can build on students feeling good about themselves, where we can build on cultural knowledge, self-relevance, right, developing a sense of who they are as legitimate in that classroom context. So the one last model I want to show you, which is, again, another test of the model, but we looked at it with a younger sample. So we found this in third to fifth graders. Does it exist in kindergarten to second grade? And so we test it. And once again, we find the model holds. It holds going down. The only thing different here is that the growth mindset to positive classroom behavior, which keep in mind it's the weaker relationship in the other with older kids, it drops out. It's not significant. But the, the path is exactly the same for five to eight-year-olds. It goes growth mindset. When they have a sense of themselves as having a lot of potential, they, have, they identify more with attributes of being a good student. They behave better in school. And it predicts classroom behavior. And in this study, we have a smaller sample. right? And with these younger kids, what's interesting is we're still predicting 28% of the variance in our model. So we are accounting for a lot of the difference in student outcomes. And the two places that are not significant are also interesting, because what I want you to keep in mind, right, is that the one piece of school that's extremely sub subjective that we don't talk about is this is according to teachers, and that's according to teachers. In both of those variables, it's the teacher's perception of the child's behavior. It's the teacher's perception of the child's performance. I'm a teacher. It is, there's subjectivity in the work that we do. There always is. And so that space between us is really important for us to bring into high relief. 
And so to get to the last little bit here, my, the Mindset Performance Link offers two directions for enhancing school context. We can reframe ideas about potential and integrate these ideas into the culture of the classroom. And if we want it to be sustainable, we do it at every level of the culture classroom. We can build greater identification with school by attending to the social representations that foster negative ability stereotypes. And so in the last piece, we, I want to talk about some of the work that we did in the school. I'm not so interested in the big piece, but I want to give you a feel for some of the practices that we were trying to develop and also what it looked like for us to try to do this work in schools. And now, as we try to learn how to scale that up to give it away to other schools. So again, I just want to come back to this model because it's always about attending to the whole system. And so the school we were working with, Closita Tulalip um, Elementary, is located on the Tulalip Indian Reservation. At the time that we started the intervention work, both schools, so we had combined the two schools, were in the bottom 5% of schools in the state. Approximately 550 students each year, that varied a little bit. Um, on average, there were about 80% native, 10% other minority, which means there were about 9, 10% white. 76% um, free reduced lunch. So in the past, the district scores reflected the same pattern as the state of no change for Native American students. This is important because, right, Native students hear this too. They, they know. It gets published in the newspaper. They know. But what this did and, and the work we were trying to do was to free them from that to eliminate that stigma. And so I'm not going to go too much into the model, but these were the pillars originally that we started with, growth mindset, culture relevance, data teaming. So I'm going to talk, right, I've already introduced culture and, and growth mindset to you, but I want you to see what that looked like. So in this school, we created immersion environments. So we have a morning welcome assembly. It continues to this day. The kids come to school. They come to the gym, they don't go to their classroom, they find their class, their class in the gym, and there's a welcome song that's done, that's a, wait, a tribal welcome song. So there are now many that have been gifted by elders in the community. And then an adult does a welcome message. And in that welcome message, what they're trying to do is to highlight the interface of culture and mindset. And so for a long time, every month, there was a focus on one tribal value and one characteristic of growth mindset. And so it, because there are different numbers, every month you could focus on something different. So what this looked like is around the school you might see posters, right, growing our mindsets. Um, and by the way, this is the kids' favorite because they think it looks like a butt. <laughs> butt brains are very funny in elementary school. We changed the student guidelines for success. So instead of champs or pride, we had grow. So grow your brain at least six hours a day. Respect yourself, all people and things. Own your actions and attitudes. And welcome all who come to our community. Right? The power of this is that it changes the conversation when a child is misbehaving. Right? So instead of saying, this is not acceptable, you can say, you know, you have a responsibility to grow your brain every day, six hours a day. And not only are you not growing your brain, you're keeping your friends from growing their brain. It gets into this very different and meaningful conversation. Um, instead of focusing so much on changing kids, there was a lot of focus on professional development. We actually started by changing teachers' mindsets. And it's something that I now feel very passionate about. Um, we also wanted to build this connection to community. And so you may be aware of like those bumper stickers that were out there. My child was an honor student at such and such school. So we changed that to honoring families in school. So it looked like my child was honored by Quilcita and Tulalip Elementary. More and more through this morning assembly, families were welcome. There, we saw an increase in community engagement, but more importantly, we saw more children wanting to engage in tribal ceremony. Huge numbers of children wanting to be part of salmon ceremony, right? wanting to be part of their community because the school was playing a role in reifying that relationship. And finally, sending teams of teachers and staff um, to family celebrations and ceremonies, including funerals. 
so that kids could see them there in the good times and the bad. And so I just want to show you a few of the outcomes, and then I'm going to conclude. So in, in those three years that we worked together, we saw kindergarten and first graders lead the district in oral reading fluency, right? And this is including like co-op, right, where you've got parents with huge engagement. And we saw our native kids leading the district. 95% of kindergarten and 80% of first graders were proficient or above benchmark in reading. On state literacy tests, 38% of third grade students met standard and another 30% were within 10 points of making standard. Right? In the fall, and this was in the third year, the majority of students were, were significantly below standard, more than 100 points on a 600 point test. And so using measures of academic progress, which is a test in literacy and math for grades third to fifth, during the spring, right, during just a short period of time, we saw 60% of students make more than one year's growth, and at least half of these students made one and a half to two years growth. And so the school met state annual, annual measurable objectives in every category, with native students meeting state standards, improving by 18%. Can I remind you that these were kids who did not change for many years. And so in conclusion, using the culture cycle to enhance academic performance, right, we can alleviate this struggling native student narrative right, if we engage native students at the level of interventions that are culturally grounded, that focus on all levels of the culture cycle. It isn't children who need to change. It's systems that need to change. It's understanding that we can value, in all of the work we've done with, with first-generation college students, in all of the culture work, it never impacts European Americans. They benefit too. So it's not like we have to choose one way or the other. We can do both. And given our changing demographic, it's important that we learn how to do both. And it's important for European Americans to learn how to be interdependent so that they also can move between these contexts in the work world. We can do this by building schools that reflect and foster a diversity of viable ways of being, by creating matches, by helping students build identities that maximize potential. So ma ma right, building matches means finding ways for interdependent children to feel good in our school context. And finally, by valuing old identities, who they are and what they bring to school, and scaffolding new identities. In other words, we want more than one self per customer. Thank you.